Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Reading this morning from Merging with Shiva, Lesson 161. Panchakshara is perfection. Om Namah Shivaya is such a precious mantra because it is the closest sound that one can make to emulate the sounds rushing out of the self into the mind. Chanting it is profound because it is a sound channel which you can follow to get close to the self of yourself. Sort of like following a river upstream to yourself. Om Namah Shivaya can be equated with Shiva's drum of creation called Dhammaru. When Om Namah Shivaya is repeated, we go through the chakras. Nama Shivaya Om. The Om is in the head chakra. Within Nama Shivaya is each of the elements earth, water, fire, air, and ether, which in the mind are transmuted into all pervasive consciousness. And that is also transmuted into the great chakra way above the head at the end of the Om. In just a breath, the space of time between the next repetition of Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, the pranas, having reached Parashiva, fall back into the spiritual, mental, astral, and physical worlds, blessing them all with new energy, new life, and new understanding. Namah Shivaya Om, Namah Shivaya Om, Namah Shivaya Om, Namah Shivaya Om is the constant process of life. It is the essence of life itself. That's quite a lot to assimilate. <laughs> Maybe I should stop there before we totally overwhelmed here. Well, lots of ideas here, um, but there, there's a very uh, interesting one, new energy. The pranas, having reached Parashiva, fall back into the spiritual, mental, astral, and physical worlds, blessing them all with new energy, new life, and new understanding. You've all heard one of my analogies, which is you take a shower that's turned on, you have water coming out of it, you have the shower head, and then you make the shower head invisible. Remember that one? So you have water coming out of something that's invisible, or something coming out of nothing. So, of course, the, the nothing or the invisible shower head is Parashiva. So somehow energy comes out of it, so to speak. Oh, well, therefore, what we're talking about here is, could be imagined as all of a sudden there's a lot more water. <laughs> Something increased the water. We got more water flowing. So if there's more water flowing, we must have uh, attained Parashiva, because that's what happens. It increases, it gives new energy, new life, and new understanding. Came up with a trick question to ask everyone. If you had a multiple choice question, how many chakras are there? 7, 14, or 21? Which one would you choose? In Guru Deva's teachings. 21. Hmm? 21? Well, yes, you choose all three. <laughs> <laughs> all of the above. Okay. So, 
in Gurudeva's writings, sometimes he talks about seven chakras. It sounds like there's only seven of them. And then sometimes he talks about 14, and you're sure there's only 14. And then once in a while he talks about 21, but not very often. Oh, this is talking about chakras, so that, that thought came to my mind this morning early. <clears throat> Seven, of course, is the most common number. If you read books on chakras, it'll say there's seven chakras. And um, to clarify that, Gurudeva sometimes uses the word principle. Seven principal chakras, main ones. So those are the, the chakras we're used to that he's talking about here. Muladhara chakra through the Sarasvara chakra. There's seven of them. But below those are the seven lower chakras, which most people don't talk about, starting with fear, and then we get anger, then we get jealousy, and then it gets really pretty low-minded down there. <laughs> so there's seven that go down, and one of the unique things in, in Gurudeva's teachings is can you heard me say this, which is lots of teachers when they talk about the chakras, the emphasis on let's stimulate the higher chakras, right? That's what we want to do. We want to stimulate the higher chakras. But Gary David's emphasis is well, let's close off the lower ones first. Because <laughs> whatever you stimulate, uh, they all get stimulated. So if, if you have more uh, energy in the higher chakras, you're going to have more energy in fear and anger unless you close that off. So we don't want that. We don't want to cause ourselves more of a challenge in controlling fear and anger by intensifying anything before those are not present. So those are the seven lower chakras. Then there's seven above, which he rarely talks about. He says they're so subtle, they're more like nadis, meaning uh, nerve currents, than they are chakras. He does make reference to them above the stars far. There's seven more that can be explored. And he gives names for them in the, the lexicon. Well, that's the answer. That all three are correct. 7, 14, and 21. <clears throat> in terms of Guru Davis writings. Let's see what else is here. That's probably good for them. We must realize that at any given moment we are a complete Parashiva Satchirananda Jiva. We'll come back to that term in a second. Only working on the Maheshvara part, on the Jiva is becoming Shiva. Parashiva is there, Satchirananda is there, the maturity of the Purusha of the Jiva, the embodied soul, is not. Not there, of course. Therefore, Om Namah Shivaya takes us into the reality above and beyond the relatively real. To know it is to experience it, and to experience it is to become initiated. It's a nice way of explaining what initiation is. It's an experience. Well, this is a very important point, and said simply, part of us is always identical with God. Nothing has to happen for that to be true. The divine within us is always there, and we call it the essence of the soul. In, in English we say uh, pure consciousness, and transcendent reality in English words. So there's two aspects of God, of Shiva, which are inherent in the nucleus of the soul. Or well, in that sense, Jiva is Shiva or Shivoham. It's always true. Nothing you do affects that fact. But the soul body is maturing. The soul body has a lot of work to put in to get itself up to uh, the vibration of Shiva's soul body. So when we look at the soul body, we're separate from Shiva. So we're both. And that's a very important point. And 
Said another way, we have an outer nature comprised of emotions and thinking and instincts. And that has nothing to do with Shiva, human nature, and that inside of us is a divine nature. So let's use that one, human nature and divine nature. And it's a sliding scale. Zero to a hundred. <clears throat> at the zero point, we're only aware of our human nature. We're not at all aware or we're not even acknowledging our divine nature. We don't think it exists. God doesn't exist. <laughs> But we haven't even thought about the question. We're just so busy uh, experiencing the world. Haven't thought about it much. <laughs> 100% that probably happens after you leave the physical body somewhere. 90-95% <laughs> maybe is a great yani. 95% of them is identified with this divine nature and just 5% with the human nature. Well, the whole spiritual path is, is the point we're trying to move up. That's what spiritual progress is. That's what spiritual practice is for. We're trying to move. So we start zero and a hundred, five and ninety-five, ten and ninety, and so forth. We're moving up, becoming more and more identified with the divine nature and less and less identified with the human nature. That's the goal. So the human nature is imperfect. I, I even read it in, in Yoga Swami the other day. It says everyone's imperfect, meaning the human nature. And sometimes the imperfection then it disturbs us because we think it should be perfect, but no, that's the wrong part of you. <laughs> Divine nature is already perfect. Human nature always has certain problems. <laughs> and to keep them under control. So you get a sense of what Gurudev is talking about. We're moving up in our division between human nature and our divine nature. I have been performing Om Namah Shivaya for over 50 years. First, it had no meaning other than, wonderful, at last I got my mantra, and an assignment from my guru to perform Japa regularly. As the japa progressed, all the inner worlds opened, all the doors of the mind. All the spiritual forces were unleashed, and the ability to control them came naturally. You see, Namah Shivaya Om brings the totality of the individual to the forefront and makes it manifest in daily life. This most pragmatic mantra is found at the center of the Vedas and the hymn known as Sri Rudra. And Shiva is the center of Nama Shivaya. As the center of the Vedas, it blends Vedanta with Siddhanta. Fusing them together with the fire of realization. So I and all Saiva Siddhantans are a fusion of Vedanta and Siddhanta with all doors open of understanding of the 14 windows, the chakras of the mind, and even more than that. In fact, we're never up to 14 now. Started with seven. <laughs> so notice he says 14 windows, the chakras of the mind, and even more than that. So he's making reference to the other ones. Then he talks about importance of japa. But I wanted to comment on this one last idea here: the fusion of Vedanta and Siddhanta. We talked about that before. In this context, Vedanta means monism, and Siddhanta means theism. Or Advaita and Advaita Vada and Ishvara Vada, Sanskrit. So we are Advaita Ishvara Vadas. Quite a mouthful. 
That's who we are. Because <laughs> we believe in both. In other words, we give equal emphasis to both practices, worship of the deity in the temple, that's our Siddhanta in this context, and meditation on the divine nature within which is already one with Shiva. That's our monism, meditation. So we have temple worship for theism and meditation for monism, both practices. And we give most Vedantins don't give that much importance to Ishvara, to the personal deity. They're not good. They basically, you know, give token uh, appreciation or token acknowledgement of Ishvara. Their whole emphasis is on uh, the divinity within. They're not trying to uh, pay that much attention to devotion. In Shun, these two are called different perspectives. Remember the four perspectives? Shun, Leaf, Mu, Leaf, Sim, Leaf, and Deep Phi? It used to be Deep Phi. <laughs> right now it's Deep Phi. <laughs> so I thought we could look at two of them. The four is quite a lot to encompass at once. Deep Phi. One of the four... Deep Phi. One of four perspectives, the metaphysical viewpoint of looking into inner and outer space. It is a perspective that acknowledges, understands, and communicates with God and God's beings on the astral plane, people from other planets. It is here that all psychic phenomena take place. Inside the Siddhanta, it includes the consciousness of the devas, Mahadevas and God, Shiva experienced in the temple. It is Dvaita, or a dualistic viewpoint. This is kind of broadened beyond just the deity and uh, even beings that are more, not, not so unfolded. <laughs> um, beings you'd see more in psychic experience, psychic experiences. Um, but the basic quality is, what are we doing? We're going within a bit and then we're looking out. We're seeing somebody else who's not us. That's the essence of this perspective. There's a second being who is not us. The totally separate being we're seeing and communicating with. And depending on the nature of that being, if it's God, if it's a Mahadeva, if it's a Deva, where they even has beings from other planets, um, people on the astral plane, we relate to them in different ways. We don't relate to uh, our grandfather on the astral plane the same as we relate to God Shiva, you know, just because we happen to see them both <laughs> with our inner sight. There's a different protocol for different beings. But we're, we're seeing them and they're separate. So we're going within and we're looking into different planes with our inner sight and we're seeing other beings. So in deep feed, there's always two. It's dualistic, as it says. It is Dvaita, or a dualistic viewpoint. There's no monism at all. There's lots of people. One population count was 330 million. At that point in time, there may be more now. Upatu Mokori Devarka Mangal. 330 million gods is what it says, but I think it just means 330 million residents in a certain loka. 33 crore. Shunif, one of four perspectives, a meditative viewpoint of being awareness flowing from one area of the inner mind to another. Mind itself being stationary. The perspective of the Shun Chef language. It is also simply called the Shun perspective. In Saiva Siddhanta, it includes the deeper meditative practices. It is an Advaitic or monistic viewpoint. 
in order for monism to work, you go in, you can't go out. If you go in and go out, you're in dualism. So you have to go in and stay within yourself. You don't use your psychic abilities, your spiritual eye, to look out and see into realms. You're looking in. You're just going deeper within and within and within of yourself. So you have to stay within yourself, and then if you go deep enough, you find the essence of your soul. So you have to stay within yourself to find that. There's no other persons involved. It's just you. So these two perspectives are very different, and generally they aren't uh, combined in the same philosophy they are being so different. People are usually just monists or theists. Most uh, Vedansans are monists, and the theists, the biggest group of theists, are the Vaishnavas. They're so theistic, their description of Shiva is very simple. Um, this is Ishkan's description. <laughs> I don't know the other traditions that well, but so she was meditating, that's the classic pose. So in Vaishnavism, the only thing they could conceive of is Shiva must be meditating on Vishnu. They're so, you know, they're totally dualistic. <laughs> they don't have the idea of just going in themselves. They can't, they're not thinking that Shiva's meditating on himself. I mean, why would he meditate on the second person? He's just going deeply within himself. Oh, it shows how inherently theistic they are in their thinking. Oh, thank you very much. Have a wonderful day.